Good afternoon and welcome to the Preservation Association of Lincoln Brown Bag Lecture Series. My name is Eileen Burke, and I am the coordinator of these brown bags. The videotaping today is sponsored by the Historic Preservation Fund of the U.S. Department of the Interior through the Nebraska State Historical Society and the City of Lincoln, a certified local government. Our speaker today is Ed Zimmer. Ed is the City of Lincoln Preservation Planner, a position that he's held for 28 years. Before coming to Lincoln, Ed was a freelance architectural historian in Boston. He's a native of Omaha, Nebraska, and has an undergraduate degree from Lindenwood College and a PhD from Boston University. Ed's talk today is titled, The Strauss Brothers in Eastridge, The Trend Home for the Baby Boom. And we're also going to be, Pal is also going to be sponsoring an Eastridge walking tour this fall that'll go along with this brown bag. So please join me in welcoming Ed Zimmer. Thank you. The heart of this talk, of course, is to answer exactly where is that view. And I searched and searched, and I think I found it. And I will show it to you, and you'll have to take it on faith, because it looks nothing at all like that. Uh, Strauss Brothers had been a building firm in Lincoln um, well before Eastridge, um, but not quite this far back. Um, this, begin this starts us at the original plat of Lincoln, which took us east only as far as 17th Street. So we have to make our way quite a bit farther than that. Um, and we'll do that by climbing the Capitol in seven 1870 or so and looking that same southeast direction. Not quite east enough for Eastridge, but I can only use the available photos. And we're looking off towards the east and southeast, um, and somewhere out there, and probably a little more to our left, is Eastridge, and you recognize it, of course. And in fact, it looks a lot like the Strauss brothers' early views um, of, of the area. Canard House, um, just there in the center with the cupola, and Mr. Gillespie's house, his backyard neighbor, uh, is behind him. And this talk will be part of how we go from 1870 to modern Lincoln. And we'll stop along the way just briefly that the Strauss brothers, of course, were not the first affordable home builders in Lincoln or the first, what we might call, tract home builders. Um, there were certainly earlier builders appealing to the starter market, and Gerke is one of my favorites among those, not just for calling himself the bungalow man, but for his advertising line, uh, marry the girl, then see Edward Gerke. That he's, he's clearly pitching to the starter home. And Gerke built perhaps 300 houses. Uh, this was his own house on Park Street, which he called Rose Cottage and still extant. Um, this is his California court um, down just below um, 28th Street and south of Randolph um, where he built small bungalows on very small lots um, but with all the bungalow features including porches that almost stood out as gazebos at the corner of the house um, as shown in the lower left here. and built east of East Campus, um, or west of East Campus, west of Lincoln General Hospital, um, and particularly in the Woods Park neighborhood on Marshall Avenue and um, South 31st. And this is the view on Marshall. Gerke was also a snapshot photographer and took pictures of a lot of his own houses. Uh, and there's that row today. But now we'll get all the way out east. Uh, and this is 1941, uh, my earliest uh, aerial photo that shows us the area before any of the residential development uh, east of Cotner and east of 56th Street. Piedmont uh, had developed beginning in 1924 um, at the corner of 
uh, 56th and A Streets. There's Cotner with um, one lone house um, just up above where I've labeled it. A, O, 56th and 70th. So that whole square mile essentially was standing uh, almost open, most of it owned uh, by members of the Taylor family. And the east half of it will develop as Taylor Meadows quite a, quite a long time after Eastridge. Um, you can just see the curve of development out at the VA Center, uh, VA Hospital on 70th, uh, that was in place by 1930-1931. And most of this area, not quite as far north as I've indicated, but almost as far north, uh, develop as Eastridge between 1953 and 1960. Uh, Strauss Brothers have been building um, in other neighborhoods of Lincoln, particularly um, north and west of um, 70th and O, and we're experimenting with some of the same ideas that they would develop um, in Eastridge. But really their full bloom of, of their thinking about residential development um, occur in the Eastridge area. And if we zero in, looks like somebody was uh, operate. the Taylors had an orchard on part of the area um, that will become Eastridge. They plat Eastridge in Eastridge edition in 1953 and then subsequent editions up till 1960. Um, and the first part describes that um, curve that they make of Randolph Street that sort of becomes the, the spine of Eastridge. And if you look at the streets curving into it, taking advantage of the, the topography, streets like J bend out of their east-west alignment, um, as does Randolph, but not quite to the same degree, so that in Eastridge today, we can have an intersection of J and Randolph, which in Woods Park and my neighborhood just east of Woods Park if you have an intersection of Jay and Randolph, you've had some terrible accident. But, but in Eastridge, with that um, responding to the lay of the land and using the post-World War II more curvilinear layout, um, you do get these intersections. And this is my favorite. Um, and they create, with that um, curvilinear layout, um, beautiful streets like, um, I think I'm on Randolph here, looking. And whenever I describe a direction, it's sort of, because Eastridge is not north, south, and east, west. This is Randolph looking sort of east. Um, but the great curve, and then echoed by the sidewalks, and then lined by the great stands of trees, um, which really kind of march in a soldier row down many of the Eastridge streets. Um, or up on, uh, this is Eastridge Drive itself. And while obviously uh, in the summer when this all greens up, it looks uh, quite different from my, my early spring views, we don't see much once the trees fill in and, and it really becomes a much more enclosed landscape. There are a couple wonderful um, advertising booklets that um, have been shared with me that explain much of the, the thinking and philosophy um, of the Strauss brothers um, as they developed Eastridge. I think this is the older of the two they also have great 1950s color schemes. There's the green one and the pink one. And we'll start with the green one, because I think it is the earlier of the two. Um, and they explain in, in great detail um, why you should own your own home, and specifically why you should buy it from them. Um, but they say, owning one's own home is part of the great American dream. Everyone wants the sense of security that comes from owning one's own home. Home ownership is the bulwark of our free economy. Every tree or plant a homeowner cares for carries his roots with it to a new and greater depth in the community. Um, and also that the average homeowner is a more mature and responsible citizen. Um, not automatically, I wouldn't think, but, but still a, a great idea. Um, but also wonderful um, pictures illustrating their, um, the people that they want to buy their homes. Um, they describe that in the United States, um, at the time they're publishing this in the mid-1950s, they estimate that an average worker 
works around 5,700 hours to earn enough to buy a $9,000 home. In England, he would work 23,000 hours. In France, 30,000 hours. And in Russia, 40,000 hours if the government would let him own his own home. So. They also um, go to lengths about uh, in their interiors, and we'll get into that a little, a little more uh, in this talk, but particularly if we're so fortunate in the fall as to visit um, a home or two. Uh, their living rooms were carefully designed, particularly in the early years, to all look over the backyard. Um, the bedrooms and kitchen were arranged to the front of the house, but the backyard was the family space. And so in the plans, the, court, the backyards uh, or the living rooms typically looked out on the backyard, not on the front. And so we even get in their illustrations of, of some of their key model homes trying to find, well, where's the carport? There's got to be a carport. But well, we're looking at the backyard of the house um, in this view, not the front. Carport is actually off to the left. In, in this, the, the trend name uh, they drew from describing a survey they conducted of 600 families, um, seeing what young families uh, post-World War II wanted in their homes, and then uh, hiring the architects George and John Unthank to design based on the trends of what families wanted in their homes. And that was the, their whole source of the trend name. And so Trendcrest was the simplest of the houses, the smallest of their uh, three original houses. Um, and they describe if you're looking for a two-bedroom home that is large, that has a larger than two-bedroom feeling, then the trend crest is the answer to your dreams. Uh, and they, they have many answers to dreams in their write-up, um, including the kitchen. Um, and I don't know if I'll find it again, but um, I think the dishwasher was also an answer to everyone's dreams. Um, the kitchen. Here the trend crest has what women have been waiting for, more workspace, more countertops, more covered space, and a larger eating area. It also looks like in the plan of some of them that you could reach every surface from the kitchen that they, in a different setting, would be described as a galley kitchen. Um, this is uh, George Unthank studying the model of one of the homes. The, the first architects they employed were uh, George and John Unthank. Um, a few years later, they also um, hired Colonel Cunningham, who had come to Lincoln to work on the state capitol, um, and he did some of the subsequent designs. His house is the um, large ranch house at the northeast corner of 27th and Sheridan Boulevard, and so he believed in the ranch house because he designed one for himself. They also illustrate that um, not only are these houses architect designed, but many of the elements were factory built, that they were mass producing the houses and had set up um, factory production lines. Actually, what they're illustrating here is, is a university testing of the truss they were using on the house. And I think what they're doing is crushing it and seeing at what, what point it will fail, uh, far beyond our snow loads. I also kind of like that you can see it's a plywood model um, of the house. The, the smaller of the earlier designs uh, typically had carports. They also did uh, enclose garages on some of the um, plans two and, let's see, not plan two, but they did on plan three. Plan two, they called the den trend because they included a den. Um, gets to be hard to say. I think if you say den trend fast, you almost always would trip over it. Um, from the street or from the rear, the den trend home is a home of beauty. The privacy afforded by the inner terrace or patio is unlimited. The hardwood floors are a matchless beauty, beauty that will last a lifetime, except in the other houses where they used cork flooring, and that was even better. Um, but you write up each one. Uh, the general electric air wall heating system will keep your home wonderfully warm all winter. 
No cold drafts or hot blasts in the dent trend. Hard to read. Uh, and this, I think, is a, approximately one of those. They stress, well, I think as, if you drive through um, Eastridge, kind of looking for the typical home, they changed them every year. They had several models each year, and they also stressed that with materials, uh, features like whether you enclosed a garage or used a carport, uh, whether you had an outdoor fireplace, that the houses could be varied. And while the roof lines from some of those view look like they're all the same house, that was never the intention, was not the advertising. And I think as we see them adapted by families now, part of what makes it so interesting is the variations within the theme, um, either from the original design or from the adaptations people have since added. Uh, this is one of the uh, earliest houses, about 1954. And I suppose for full disclosure, I should say where it is. Fifty-six, nope, that was, the one I showed earlier was 5615 Randolph, and this one is 519 Lincrest, 1954. And then the tri-trend in, in that early one was the big one. Um, all of about 1,300 square feet, although they would carefully list in their write-ups um, how much space there was under the roof, because with the carports and the garages, there was quite a bit, um, often almost 50% more under the roof than there was in the living space alone. And the tri-trend um, breathes with enchantment. Here is a home beyond comparison in its price field. The living room with its large picture window lets you enjoy the outdoors year-round. The large storage unit in the living room is custom elegance at its best. Uh, closets as custom elegance. But, uh, the fashion right bathroom is deluxe. You'll love the shower over the tub and the structure glass around it giving even a larger appearance. The medicine cabinet lends itself to casual living. It is large and can accommodate the whole family. Apparently, not really the whole family in the medicine cabinet, but maybe their toothbrushes. And then they go into quite a bit of detail about their uh, construction um, from um, the grading and there's a nice road grader at the bottom. Um, no, no horses with drags, and I think this would be about the era that we would first stop seeing um, some horsepower used in digging basements particularly. Um, there were partial basements under um, these houses typically for certain years. And then trying on the back cover, making sure you didn't uh, make a mistake um, that if you had all the facts and checked all the boxes, uh, you would clearly uh, be down at the bottom of the page and buy from the Strauss brothers. And we can see how quickly uh, the area develops in this 1957 aerial. So they've only been under construction for four years and have not entirely filled the area, particularly down towards A Street on the uh, southeast quadrant, there are streets yet to build, but already uh, most of the area has been filled from L down to A with um, Pius High School, um, newly built, visible down at the bottom, and up at the um, top um, right edge, uh, that large sort of pie slice is Eastridge Elementary. The uh, elementary school the community swimming pool, Eastridge Church, were all parts of the original layout and the original plan. And they stressed the uh, completeness of this development that, that they were encouraging. They stressed in some of the early ones that they also had a commercial area within the subdivision, and they must be really referring to um, something nearby because there really wasn't uh, any commercial zoning within the, or any commercial development within Eastridge proper. Zeroing in on a little closer. 
Um, and now, now on to the mystery of where is this street? We, we could do audience participation, you could try to guess. Um, and that's kind of what I was doing on Sunday as I struggled with the question. You can just see Eastridge Elementary um, off to the upper right, the band of windows on the, on the back side of it. So I had to guess I was looking more or less north and east from some high prominence on a curving street. That makes it easy. There's prominences all over and almost all the streets curve. And looking at a map gives you no help at all. Um, the, what made it workable was the second house in because it's brick. It has a simple gable roof, which is actually rather rare as you drive around the neighborhood, and it doesn't offer a carport, uh, at least not visible. Well, you can see one in the near foreground and one just beyond it, and then a great station wagon just down beyond. So I, I drove the whole neighborhood looking for the station wagon and couldn't <laughs> find it, and that wasn't much help. What I really love is how much from this rather ordinary vantage point, and they're not standing, they're maybe on a ladder, but they're not at an elevated point of any, uh, any scale, that you're looking over all of those rooftops. And the early development looks so bare. It's moraine, and you knew. <laughs> That's still good to figure it out. For. Um, and there's, there's the brick house, second one. Carport still an open carport beside it, and you can't see any other houses. By the, you're done kind of at that point. Now, if you really work it, they are planting trees in this view. They look like they're about one inch caliper maybe, um, but those two trees, I think, would be those two trees. Um, they aren't. They didn't all survive, but obviously many of them did, and. It's such a wonderful treed environment. I think that's a predominant part of the environment today. Uh, and the houses nest among the trees where previously uh, the intention was there, but the, the landscape was not. Their line about homeowners putting down their roots deep in the community, I think, is borne out by uh, the tree canopy that's now Eastridge. Uh, this gentleman's walking down Moraine as well. He's just slipped over to the other side of the street because we still have our brick house right in the middle. Um, and our station wagon's still down there. I had to get intrigued when I spotted the station wagon again um, out of a combination carport garage. I haven't figured that one out yet. Um, but I could go so far as it's a 1954. Um, so it's a 1957 booklet. Um, if you're buying a house, you, a three-year-old car is not bad at all. Um, but I think it's a 1954 Ford. Internet is a wonderful thing, and I had to do a little flipping it so the license plate reads backwards, but it makes it line up better with the, the one sticking out of the carport. Um, in the pink book, um, they, they show, um, by now we're developing even down um, towards the A Street corner. Um, we're, we're on the south here looking north. No, we're on the north looking south, sorry. So there's Eastridge School um, on the lower right, and um, you just see the oval for Pius up on the uh, top edge. And so we've not developed the um, A Street corner yet. We're up at the northern development still. So I matched that up to um, my 1957 aerial. Um, I want to look at the school for just a minute. Originally, the school operated in, um, I think, four or five of the houses before, as classrooms, as the school building was being built. Um, and we see the play field, and below, because I don't have a wide enough angle, and I can't stand far enough back to get um, a straight-on view, but this was an architect's view of the school with its new roof, um, which conceals the heat pumps for the ground coupled. It's now a geothermal heated and cooled school building. And while um, 
it was a significant change to the design of the school, it certainly still retained its horizontality. I don't think we can um, feel like that is a steep roof. And interestingly, because the sidewalk is so much higher than the school in the original design, you always looked at the roof of the school. And it's always kind of awkward looking at a flat roof with its mechanicals. Now you look at the school with a, a standing seam metal roof concealing all of that mechanical equipment. There's not anywhere near the ceiling height in this rather low built building to hide that stuff up inside the roof under the ceiling. So it's up on top of the old roof under the new roof. And the church, which has been built um, over many additions and changes, um, was a unthanked designed building in its original form and was part of the original concept. And built in as well um, was the community swimming pool so this seems to be the gentleman coming home in the evening with the sun behind him. Um, and this seems to be their suggestion of your daytime life, although I think the mother's walking the babies is probably much more the daytime activity than lounging by the pool. Um, they stress Colonel Cunningham in the 57 um, edition of the book um, as their consulting architect. So it wasn't unthank throughout. And then in subsequent years, as they build up towards 1960, they um, employ a lot of um, contemporary ranch house and split level designs that aren't as derived from the first few years. And so as you get down to that um, southeast corner of the neighborhood, there's really quite a mix of the, the ranch styles of the day. Um, and it's not, not at all um, a cookie cutter design. So there are 1957 houses. The 200 was the economical one. And again, they're answering your dreams. That, that's this, their, their line and again and again. Um, and this is uh, about lines up with that um, version. And this is... Fifty-eight ten Randolph. The four hundred series. It was their three bedroom in nineteen fifty-seven. And I think you get a good look um, in the plan there, beside the garage, which uh, came with the uh, the bigger versions, and this one. Um, is a split level. The kitchen is just beside it, and it is that little galley space then with the counter it bends out into the family room. So they really are combining um, the kitchen. And I would guess that in some of these houses, maybe that wall has come down and the kitchen is the whole family room, um, because that was a not, not exactly contemporary style kitchen, um, you know, other than maybe in an apartment. And they stress the, um, particularly their uh, time-saving equipment, some of the factory-built items that they, they are preparing off-site and bringing, bringing back to site. I also like the guy in his flannel shirt with his tie, because you, you, you know he's, he's a surveyor because he wears a tie with his flannel. Um, Many of the early houses and a big push in their design were both um, their roof, which was not shingle, but rather built up, uh, three layers of asphalt cemented together and then covered with, with um, tar and gravel up on top of that. Um, and their windows, which were um, in 57, an Anderson window, but with insulated glass. And uh, they stress that it's an all glass seal. It is. Um, just how they did that, um, but glass, when it's, when it's hot, is very malleable. Um, and they're stressing that, that it's a sealed pocket of only glass, not some other material forming the seal. I'm already conscious of what's going to happen to a lot of the insulated windows. Um, and we still see some of the built-up roofs. Many of them now are replaced with shingle. Um, but this house um, has a built-up roof. And there actually are three in a row on Meadowbrook. Uh, off to the 
fact, maybe four in a row. Um, sometimes a little hard to tell because um, the roofs are so flat, you have to get to the high point and look down on them. But you can see the, the gravel, um, which was intended to be a light material, a light color and reflect uh, summer sun and, and ward off some of the heat from the interior. And then they strongly stressed that their um, equipment was brand name and advertised um, all of these brands as, as um, parts of what they employed in the house. And we still recognize, I think, several of those brands of overhead doors and, and Formica. And, um, can you, I think you can buy a Frigidaire still. <laughs> I'd like the description when I've been to some neighborhood events that if you're remodeling in your East Ridge home and you decide you want to replace your windows, it's very rude to throw them away. It's polite to put them out on the curb because one of your neighbors might find your windows that you're discarding to be um, in better condition than theirs that they're trying to maintain. And you, you put them out as a gift to your neighbors and somebody takes them away um, before the trash day. And then finally, of course, um, price does matter, and, but they put that on the page with the pretty ladies and the babies um, so that you're thinking about price in the right ways. Um, and so I think of that kind of bare landscape um, and what develops um, in that landscape the sidewalks and the trees and the nice little houses lining them uh, really do create, I think, a complete environment that they had in mind and that they stressed uh, would develop in the neighborhood. And so finally, check all of those things. Are you going to get a built-up roof? Um, do you get uh, insulated windows, brand names, and a neighborhood that's a planned community with the swimming pool and the school and the church all included? and architect designed homes, and if you check the whole list, you'll end up with a Strauss home. And I don't sell them, I don't have one for sale, but they are great fun to learn about and to, to read about. And so I hope we'll have a great tour in the fall. And I think this may be one of my shorter shows, but that's what I've got, so I would take questions and make up answers. <laughs> Matt. Uh, the question is whether any of the original built-up roofs still exist. And I, I, I really don't know, and I think it'd be a tricky one to investigate. You'd probably have to interview folks. Um, but I think that the notion was if you maintained them, they could, they could last a, a long, long while. Um, and there are quite a few still in the neighborhood. Yeah, and, and the, these houses are now, you know, the earliest ones are now 60 years old. Uh, and that's about three, three roof lifespans in a pretty ordinary fashion. Um, and it is a low pitch, um, but, and it takes maintenance. Bob. Now, now, we're in a little trouble here that, 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 that Bob and Matt, who sit next to each other and work together, are disagreeing on this. And I think you'll have to settle that outside, whether, whether any of these roofs still survive from the original. But if this gets broadcast enough on Channel 5, somebody will let me know whether theirs is an original roof, and, and then we'll, we'll have the answer. Bob. And one of the things I remember them talking about is that the truss system that was being tested in one of those photographs, uh, they were innovators in developing a truss that used, as I have memory serves, the top cord would, would typically be a rafter and the nailed wood sheathing, and the bottom cord, which would be uh, simply framing for a ceiling. Uh, between those two are typically two by four members causing the vertical web of the truss. 
and they would use plywood in various sections. So it was a very efficient way to build vertical strength in the truss and far fewer pieces and far easier to assemble. And a lot of this was indeed made in the warehouse and brought to the site when the weather allowed installation and so forth. So there, I've never been in an attic of an East Ridge home to, to see those plywood trusses. But I can imagine how they work and it's, it's, it's a good system. So this, this, this for the television viewers is Bob Ripley recounting his early days as an architect with George <laughs> and John Unthank and some of the details on their innovative trusses, um, adding plywood as some of the vertical elements um, for efficiency and for factory design. And as many houses as they put up go from that 1953 plat to the 1957 aerial, they were moving very fast. There's about, I think, 600 houses in Eastridge all told by the end. Before their before the Strauss brothers went out of business in 1970, they had constructed um, somewhere around 6,000 houses in Lincoln. So th they were a big builder. Yes, ma'am. I noticed in the 1970 or 57 brochure you showed, it talked about Carmica, but prior to that, they used a word I noticed, micarta. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about what that sort of countertop surface was? I, I don't know what that earlier micarta countertop was, um, but Matt Hansen might help us out. Micarta is actually a product that's still available. It actually uses like a, um, I think it's like a linen fabric and it's in some kind of a resin that's built up and it makes a real hard, durable material, but it's still being produced. Matt points out that micarta is a fabric that's resin impregnated and, and, and it's just built up in layers, sort of like the roof in its own version, and um, is still available. So if, you, if you're restoring your, your trend home, many of those brands are available. Do you think Ed, that the city planted those soldier trees? Would they have had a city street tree? I mean, to get them all in a straight line, or was that residents? The uh, question is whether those, those street trees were planted by the city or by residents. And I think, they were, I think the street trees were probably planted by the developer. I think they were part of the original layout. And you see the uniform design, both the placement and the species um, are quite uniform. And I think that was, and they, and they stress in their, um, in their advertising that they are putting in the sidewalks and the trees. And the, you know, I think it's part of, part of their, their vision. This is right at the beginning of subdivision requirements in Lincoln. I don't think that was a requirement. I think that was one of their amenities. Now, now there would be. Um, it'd be uh, something that would be on the private side um, as part of the development, but um, either bonded and done by the city or directly done by the developer. Robert. The Trim Ridge Apartments, originally named, not so named today, I don't believe, maybe they are, um, had a sign very much in this graphic form that were at the corner of Cotner and Vine, and where I believe was a, was a Strauss piece of construction as well. Similar style, similar detailing, and uh, um, I'm thinking there was a gentleman who's an architect, a good friend of John and George, I think it was a Sid Campbell perhaps, I'm not certain, who worked with Strauss's in, in their later years. I think that was probably one of the last developments they did. It's a, it's a very large complex of like 12, 12 mm -hmm. units per building. Very nicely done. Bob, Bob's giving me a research project of, of <laughs> checking on the original date and architect of the Trendridge apartments at Vine and Cotner, which, which do certainly in name and style look like they're, they are Strauss trend home taken to apartment scale. Handsome complex, quite quite interesting and nicely nicely maintained. Well landscaped. Mm -hmm. well, 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 we'll, know, we'll know by the tour time. I'm almost positive that those were a stress project, but we're still looking for Eastbridge homeowners who are willing to open their homes for the tour in mid-September. We don't have an exact date yet, but if you'd like to announce this, that, this, 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 
th this is Kay Logan Peters feed feeding me a line to to encourage uh, anyone who might be willing this fall to share their home uh, with a happy group of admiring tourists uh, when we take a walking tour um, that uh, reaching anyone um, on the Preservation Association of Lincoln Board or K. Logan Peters would, would be a great help for that. Would a remodeled or additioned home be on the tour okay? I, I, we do it for the original. I, I, I'm looking past you to Kay nodding and giving two thumbs up to, and I think th there's I think there's some discussion sometimes about some of the houses are modified to a to a large degree, um, but I think the variety of this neighborhood within sort of a, a theme is is what makes it strong and interesting, and um, I think it would be would be very well to see how people have interpreted their home. Well, thank you for attending on a not so nice spring spring noon, but it smells like rain and that's a wonderful thing this year. So, thank you.